News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, The Lime Slade Mystery. Welcome to News of the Times. In Lime Slade, South Wales, in 1927, a woman is beaten severely on the head and dies from her injuries after being dropped off outside her bungalow by a friend with whom she had gone to the cinema. Robbery doesn't seem to have been the motive, as the money she carried on her has not been touched. This extraordinary case gradually unfolds into an intricate case involving international travel, multiple identities, enormous amounts of money, and some dubious claims to royalty. The story of Kate Jackson, alias Kate Atkinson, alias Molly de Grease, alias Madam X, gripped the nation as Scotland Yard were called in to help unravel the case. The murder of Kate Jackson, a Duke's daughter, a ghost writer, a famous novelist, a governess for royalty, a swindler and blackmailer, is today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We hope you enjoy the show. George Harrison, Embezzlement Case, 1927. To start this story, we must jump backwards to 1927, and the famous case of embezzlement brought against Mr. George Harrison. Mr. Harrison was eventually convicted of embezzling £20,000. His defence was that he had been blackmailed by a mysterious Madam X, who required weekly payments from him, thereby leading him to embezzle funds from the company in which he worked. The blackmail began in 1914, when Mr. Harrison had had a minor car accident with Kate Jackson, going under the name of Molly Legrice. She fainted and was looked after by Mr. Harrison. This incident developed into an affair between the two. Mr. Harrison was married. Kate, known as Molly, began requesting payments to keep the secret. The payment developed into his embezzling in order to meet the financial demands. Two years later, the mysterious Madam X was unveiled to be the badly beaten Kate Jackson, found in a crumbled heap outside her bungalow. From the Western Mail, the 6th of February 1929, mysterious attack, unconscious woman and departing car, scream in the dark. Limeslade bungalow colony at the mumbled Swansea was the scene of a sensational affair late on Monday night. A married woman named Kate Jackson, aged about 50, who has for some years lived at Kenilworth, a limeslade bungalow, was found in an unconscious condition outside the bungalow, apparently having been the victim of an attack by someone who is believed to have driven away in a motor car. Mrs Jackson was conveyed to the Swansea Hospital, where she lies in an unconscious state with police officers waiting at the institution in the hope that she will recover and be able to t throw some light on the affair. In the meantime, the police, who were first informed of the affair by the hospital authorities, are pursuing another line of inquiry. As investigations are pursued regarding her antecedents and history, the connection of Kate Jackson being the hidden Madam X in the embezzlement trial is revealed by the press. Could this be the reason Kate had been murdered? From the Western Mail, the 6th of February 1929, Limeslade Mystery, Madam X Regains Consciousness, Husband's Story, Doctor Who Saw Car Near Bungalow. There were no developments on Wednesday in connection with the mysterious attack on Mrs. Kate Jackson, which took place just outside her bungalow, Kenilworth in Limeslade, Mumbles, on Tuesday night. Mrs. Jackson, who figured as Madam X and later gave evidence in a sensational London 
embezzlement case, which resulted in a trade union official being sent to penal servitude for two years, lies in a Swansea hospital in a serious condition, suffering from head injuries. Detectives and police officers have maintained a constant vigil at her bedside, in readiness to take a statement. The woman was found unconscious near the back door of her bungalow, with her head in a pool of blood and a broken flagon nearby. Husband's Story of Discovery On the night of the affair, I was reading in bed half asleep when I heard a scream and then a dog bark. I went to the door and found my wife on the ground, but raised up as if she was trying to open the door. She had apparently crawled about seven feet. She was bleeding from the head, and Dr. Taylor was called, and she was taken to the hospital. Dr. Taylor told me when he called that he met a motor car dashing away without lights when he was on his way up. As police maintain a constant vigil at Kate's bedside in hopes that she will be able to tell them what had happened, they begin to look into her history. What comes up is an exotic and almost unbelievable story regarding her parentage. Kate Jackson, alias Kate Atkinson, alias Molly Legris. There were many stories circulating about Kate Jackson, most notably her supposed exotic upbringing and her supposed international connections. From the Western Mail, the 8th of February, 1929. Madame X Afraid. Neighbour's story of a secret menace. Her early life and parentage mystery. In this statement, Mr. Jackson said that his wife told him she was born in India and called herself Molly Legris, saying that that was her pet name. When they were married, she gave the name of Kate Atkinson, of the believed in Lancaster. He also said to have expressed the belief that their adopted child is of titled parentage. His wife had always been something of a mystery to him. She had told him that once she was bought the identity of a girl who went to Australia, and she had also said that she was the youngest daughter of a duke. Letters with a Crest It is a fact that she several times received letters in envelopes bearing a crest, and she sometimes received anonymous letters but she never told me the contents of them, although they appeared to worry her. As time went on, I became convinced that my wife married me because she wanted me to protect her from someone. She never told me her real secrets, and I don't know today who she really is. I know she is very accomplished and can speak several languages. Neighbour and Intense Fears Mrs. Dimmock, the neighbour whom Mrs. Jackson was with on the Monday evening in an interview, said that Mrs. Jackson had been in fear of a secret menace for five years. She would not divulge the cause of her alarm, but latterly this fear had become intensified. On Friday, a saloon car was standing on the road not far from Kenilworth. It was at night and all the lights were out. On the following day, Mrs. Jackson told her that she had been so alarmed the previous night that she had locked herself in. Mr. Jackson is understood to have made numerous statements to the Swansea police and reference to Farnborough and other places where his wife is believed to have stayed before settling at the Mumbles have caused them to make extensive inquiries in the districts mentioned. These inquiries, however, have failed so far to cast any light on the affair. Up to a late hour last night it was understood that Mrs. Jackson, although having periods of consciousness, had not recovered sufficiently to make a coherent 
statement to the police. With a case now potentially looking to be of international and possibly aristocratic leanings, Scotland Yard are called in to help. From the Western Mail, the 11th of February 1929, Madame X dead. Limeslade bungalow mystery deepens. No statement to the police. Scotland Yard officers may be called in. Mrs. Kate Jackson, who was the victim of a mysterious attack outside her bungalow home, Kenilworth, Limeslade near Swansea, died in Swansea Hospital at midday on Sunday without making a statement. And so the mystery deepens. It was late on Monday night, February the 4th, that Mrs. Jackson, who, as Madame X, figured in a sensational embezzlement prosecution in London two years ago, was admitted to the hospital suffering from grave head injuries. During the past week, references to a mysterious motor car, anonymous letters and a secret menace have been made, and the police have made extensive inquiries. The post-mortem reveals nine wounds to her head, but the actual cause of death was a heart attack brought on by the assault. Investigations from Scotland Yard reveal that Kate Jackson regularly received large amounts of money in the post. She was also known to have large amounts of cash and jewels on hand. Where did the money come from? Who was Kate Jackson, and who was the antagonist Kate was so fearful of? The neighbour Mrs. Dimmock, with whom Kate had gone to the cinema on that fateful day, reported all she knew to police and papers. From the Western Mail, the 12th of February 1929, Limeslade Mystery, Madame Ligris Novelist, former Swansea woman's strange stories of Mrs. Jackson. The chief constable of Swansea stated on Monday that the police had definitely established the identity of Mrs. Jackson. She was, he said, the daughter of a labourer and was born in Ray in Lancashire, her maiden name being Kate Atkinson. She had relatives in Lancaster, Bradford and Liverpool but they had not heard from her for years and apparently thought she had been killed during an air raid in London during the war. Married in Cardiff, Mrs Jackson, who he said to have had an adventurous career, was married in Cardiff after the war. It is understood that for a little more than two years, from 1922 to 1924, Mrs. Jackson lived at Warwick Farm, Ashvale in Surrey. Before going to Warwick Farm, she lived alone at South Hampton Street, South Farnborough in Hampshire. She bought Warwick Farm, which she afterwards sold to a Mr. Morgans of Swansea. While at Ashvale, she adopted a baby girl of whom she was very fond. The girl, Betty, is now six and is being looked after by a neighbour at the Mumbles. Romantic story. To a very special correspondent of the London Evening News, who visited Warwick Farm Ashvale on Monday, Mrs Morgans told a strange and romantic tale which gives added colour to some of the more remarkable statements concerning Mrs Jackson's career which have been made in Swansea during the past few days. Mr. Jackson, said Mrs. Morgans, was the son of my dearest friends. I had received a letter from Mr. Jackson telling me that Mrs. Jackson was coming over for a little holiday. He broke the news that his wife was bringing a baby girl with her. She arrived at Swansea, and I was the godmother of the, at the christening of the little girl who we called Betty. At that time, Mrs. Jackson said the child was her own. She stayed in Swansea with us for nearly six weeks, and during that time 
the most curious things were happening in our house. Letters came to her in at least four different names, two of which I remember were Madame Legris and Mrs. Amber. A novelist. Naturally, I spoke to her about it, and she said, You did not know I was a novelist and that I am making large sums of money from the magazines for articles I am sending to them. She added that she used various names when writing her novels and that the money she was receiving was various royalties and publishing fees. By every post came registered letters, some of them containing money orders and others packed with treasury notes. One day she called me upstairs and, and said, Look at this, is it not wonderful? She was sitting up in bed and was surrounded by treasury notes. There must have been hundreds of them piling up in front of her. She picked them up and threw heaps into the air. They all dropped all around her head and fell on the pillow. Then she said to me, That is what comes of being clever. I was a journalist at one time and was about the only woman to see the siege of Sydney Street. After that, she gave me the story of her life. A strange story, but one which I have learned is true in many details, although probably in part she has been romanticising. Mrs Jackson's Life Story Mrs Jackson explained to me that she was born in India, the daughter of a famous Scottish family, and that they had left the country when she was six years old on account of a stabbing affray. She showed me a terrible scar on her leg, which she said was caused by an Indian servant who attacked her with a knife and wounded her seriously. After this, her people decided it would be unwise to stay in India, and according to the story, they brought her back to London and lived in a house near Portman Square. She was there until she became of age, but fell in love with the butler, and after several other episodes, according to her story, she ran away. She told us she had been a governess and that she had travelled to France. She spoke French fluently. I have never met a more fascinating woman, and there was no doubt she had received a splendid education. She was very vivacious and used to say to me, Money? What is money? I have thousands, thousands for theatres and champagne. Registered letters were numerous in Swansea, and she was always changing money orders at the post office. Then, at the end of her holiday, she went to Ashvale, but soon afterwards she wrote to us asking if we could take over the farm for her. We were anxious to help, and so eventually did so. Always writing. She was always writing, and although we did not know that these were letters, she told us at the time they were short stories and novels. Money came to the farm at Ashvale, and we thought, of course, it was payments for these. When she was ill in bed, she asked me into her rooms and then produced a handsome case carved in Indian fashion and asked me to look inside. To my surprise, this case was packed with jewels, scores of costly items of jewellery, including earrings and necklaces. Mrs. Jackson took out a bracelet studded with diamonds and pearls. You can have that, she said. It's only one of scores I have. When I refused, she said, well, take it and keep it until Betty grows up. But I would have nothing to do with it. She took the jewel box away, and I do not know what happened to the contents, but probably they were sold. She always spends money as fast as it came in, and from Ashvale would travel up to London frequently. Her identity as daughter of a farmer in Lancaster is hotly disputed by her husband and friends as being not possible. They state 
she had bought that identity from a girl who had moved to Australia. No reason is given as to why she needed to buy a new identity. Theories swarm as to the possible motivations for wanting to attack Kate Jackson. They included revenge for her testimony against George Harrison several years before, possible ties to royalty, possibly the attack was aimed indirectly at her adopted daughter, Betty, possibly it was her supposed old partner, Leopold de Gris, said to have been either a butler or a portrait painter. The possibility of Kate being a serial blackmailer with multiple identities began to emerge. Could her murderer be one victim who had had enough? And what of her husband? The scream emitted by Kate when she was attacked was heard by the neighbour, her husband inside who, when called, was found to be only in his underpants, was deemed to have been slow to react. Why was he so slow in contacting medical help? And why had he not reported the incident to the police? It was the hospital who had contacted the police to report the attack. Pushing aside the many intricate variables of differing identities, international connections and dubious stories regarding her career and antecedents, Scotland Yard zero in on her husband, Thomas Henry Jackson, as the culprit of the murder. From the Western Mail, the 25th of February, 1929, Jackson arrested, dramatic developments at Limeslaid, murder charge preferred, detectives' Sunday evening visit to Bungalow. Thomas Henry Jackson, a fishmonger of Kenilworth, Limeslaid in Swansea, was arrested on Sunday evening on a charge of murdering his wife, Mrs. Kate Jackson, otherwise known as Madam X, who died in Swansea Hospital a fortnight ago as the result of severe head injuries. The arrest was effected by Chief Inspector Collins of Scotland Yard in dramatic circumstances. Jackson was removed to Swansea Police Station and detained there pending his appearance before the magistrates this Monday morning. Sequel to Police Activity When Chief Inspector Collins arrested Jackson, he was accompanied by the Chief Constable of Swansea, Mr T. Rawson, Detective Sergeant Ato of Scotland Yard and Detective Inspector Gubb of the Roses Police Force. The party travelled in the Chief Constable's car, and inasmuch the police officers have paid frequent visits to the bungalow during the past few weeks, it did not appear at first as if special significance attached to their appearance at Limeslade, which had been made concerning her adventurous career. After a cinema visit, Kate Jackson was found unconscious at the rear of her bungalow following her return from a visit to Swansea Cinema with the wife of a neighbour. Near to her was the broken glass of a flagon. For a week she lay unconscious or semi-conscious in Swansea Hospital, with police officers constantly in attendance at her bedside in the hope of securing information with regard to the assault of which she was apparently the victim. She died without making a statement and, following her death, the services of Scotland Yard officers were requisitioned to assist in elucidating the mystery. Mysterious Madam X. Consequently, the news of the arrest of Jackson created a sensation throughout the district. Jackson, it is understood, made a statement in reply to the charge. Since the death of his wife, the accused had continued to reside at the bungalow with Mrs. Jackson's adopted daughter, Betty, and to carry on his trade as a fishmonger in the Swansea and Mumbles area. Whilst Mrs. Jackson lay in hospital, it was revealed that she was the Madam X, 
who figured as a witness in a Jeans Lionel embezzlement case in which a trade union official was involved two years ago. It was also discovered that she had lived in various districts under different names and had been regarded as a woman of substantial means. In one village, she was believed to be a journalist and fiction writer, and in another, an artist gone fashion designer. Statements crediting her with distinguished parentage were also circulated, but the police inquiries revealed the fact that she was the daughter of a Lancashire farm labourer. A secret funeral. The only mourners at her funeral were her husband, his father and two personal friends. Great secrecy had been maintained in regard to the arrangements. Even the clergyman conducted the service, being ignorant of the identity of the deceased woman until shortly before the service. Jackson showed considerable emotion after the coffin had been lowered into the grave. What exactly was the case against Jackson by the police? Scotland Yard attempted to reconstruct the crime. From the Western Mail, the 13th of March, 1929, The Fate of Madame X, Police Reconstruction of the Crime, Attack in the Bungalow, Crown Allegations in Case Against Husband. Opening the case against Thomas Henry Jackson, husband of the murdered woman, at Swansea Police Court on Tuesday, the prosecuting solicitor, Mr. Robert Paling submitted the following reconstruction of the Limeslaid bungalow mystery. That Mrs. Jackson, Madam X, was battered about the head with a broken flagon bottle or a motor tyre lever after she had removed her coat. That she screamed and her coat was thrown over her head to deaden her calls and more blows struck that those blows were struck inside the bungalow and she staggered out to collapse in the backyard, that the man who struck the blows was her husband. Jackson, Mr Paling said, accompanied his wife to the hospital and there told the doctor that he would inform the police, but he returned home without having done so. There are nearly 40 witnesses for the prosecution. Jackson testified in court regarding his wife. From the Western Mail, the 13th of March, 1929. Wife as Madame Legris. The statement made to the police that morning said Mr. Paling dealt with the history of Jackson's wife previous to the assault upon her. Jackson said he first met his wife at Lyons Corner House in Piccadilly, and that would be about 1919. She told him her name was Madame Legris and that she wrote in that name. Later they lived together as man and wife. She had plenty of money and he did not work. He had had an army gratuity of £180. Later he said that the woman suggested that they should get married and they were married at Cardiff Registry Office in January 1922. They lived on a farm in Surrey, but it was unprofitable, and his wife exchanged it for a house in Rhonda Street, Swansea, where they lived until she bought a bungalow named the Laurels at Limeslade. They resided there about three years. When a man named Harrison had been tried at the Old Bailey for embezzlement, it was alleged that a large amount of money embezzled had been sent to his wife. They eventually gave up the bungalow, the laurels, and it was sold for the benefit of people from whom it was alleged Harrison had embezzled money. Dealing with what had occurred on the night of February the 4th, Jackson, in his statement, said he had gone to bed at about 8 p.m., the little girl Betty being asleep in her cot in the same room. He partially undressed and read a book. A little time later, he heard a funny noise, 
but thought it was only neighbours quarrelling. He then heard a thud and the dog rushed out of the bedroom barking. He went outside and found his wife injured and leaning partly against the back door. Mrs. Dimmock came along and helped him to get her indoors, and later he went to the house of Captain Phillips to telephone for the doctor. Statements of Neighbours Mr. Paling compared the statements of other residents in Limeslade as to what had happened, and said the statements of Mrs. Dimmock would be that the assault took place at about ten o'clock. At ten o'clock she had parted with Mrs. Jackson at the gate, and a few minutes after getting indoors she heard a scream and took no notice. A few seconds later she heard a second scream and rushed out and around the fence and found Mrs. Jackson lying on the ground outside her back door. It was plain that the attack took place at about ten o'clock. Mrs. Gammon, another neighbour, said that about ten o'clock she was in bed and heard some muffled screams. A man who was getting some coal out of the shed at ten o'clock also heard the screams. The Police Theory The conclusions we come to, said Mr. Paling, are that Mrs. Jackson arrived at home and went indoors and took off her coat, which, as you will see, is of a non-sleeve variety. She was then attacked by someone with a tire lever. She screamed and the assailant picked up her coat and threw it over her head, either to deaden her screams or stop her struggles. She then staggered outside and collapsed on the pathway. The condition of the coat and the circumstances surrounding this case are entirely consistent with that theory. The cuts on the coat, the blood stains, everything in fact corresponds. There was the prisoner and the little girl Betty, who is six years of age, who was asleep in her cot at the bungalow at the time. The prisoner was awakened according to his own story, with lights burning in the bedroom and living room. There was no one apart from the child in the house. There was no evidence of strangers in the locality or around the bungalow. I think it most unlikely that it would have been possible for an unknown assailant to have been lurking in the neighbourhood. Screams were said by people who heard them to have lasted some minutes. Jackson, according to his own story, directly he heard the screams, jumped out of bed and rushed to the back and found his wife just outside the back door. That would not have taken more than a moment. He rushed out just as he was, but saw no one and heard no one. Actions very peculiar. Jackson's story and actions were very peculiar, but I don't think they are consistent with those of an innocent man. He delayed three quarters of an hour before telephoning for a doctor and failed to communicate with the police. When Mrs. Gammon comes to help, she is more or less sent away. He made contradictory statements to the police about the tire lever, which was found in a most unusual place under a cushion. Mr. Paling continued that it was no part of the prosecution's duty to suggest motives, and they did not intend to do so. They knew, however, that Jackson was not living very happily with his wife, and that fact may have been the cause for the assault. Jackson, in his statement, had made out that his wife was a woman of mystery. There is no mystery about her, declared Mr. Paling. Her maiden name was Kate Atkinson, and she was born on July the 28th, 1885, near Lancaster in Lancashire, and was the daughter of a labourer. Jackson says he did not know who his wife was. This seems an absurd story in view of the fact that the woman's birth certificate and marriage certificate were found by the police in an unlocked drawer 
in the couple's bedroom. The woman had been receiving considerable sums of money from a man named Harrison, who was convicted on March the 30th, 1927, at the Central Criminal Court for fraudulent conversion and received a sentence of five years penal servitude. Income of £20 a week. With the money which she received from Harrison, which varied sometimes but averaged at about £20 a week, the woman kept herself and her husband. They lived in a bungalow of some size at Limeslade, which they moved into three or four years ago, but after Harrison's conviction the income ceased, and the bungalow was sold and the money was returned to the people who were defrauded by Harrison. Harrison, continued Mr. Paling, was convicted of fraudulent conversion of £20,000. The bungalow and the effects realised just over £1,000. Jackson, as a result, had for the first time for many years to go out and do some work to keep his wife, and they had to live in a less pretentious bungalow, a small pokey place, Life was naturally much more unpleasant for Jackson, commented Mr. Paling, and we cannot trace where he did his last honest work. Neighbour's Story There was a quickening of interest when Mr. Paling called Mrs. Dimmock, and a tall, dark woman entered the witness box. Olive Maria Dimmock said that she was the wife of an engineer and lived at Webbins Field, Limeslade. Usually on a Monday evening, she and Mrs. Jackson used to visit a cinema at the Mumbles together. They left together at about six o'clock on February the 4th and visited Mumbles Cinema. They left when the performance was over at about 9.30 and went straight home. They parted at their respective gates and she entered her house. She spoke to her husband and went into the bedroom to take off her hat and coat and while there she heard screams. The screams were repeated, and because she thought she could recognise Mrs. Jackson's voice, she ran out to see what the matter was. Approaching the Jackson's back door, she saw Mrs. Jackson on the ground and Mr. Jackson trying to lift her up. Jackson's defence. In general, Jackson was seen to have handled himself well in court under cross-examination. He denied any knowledge of the crime. He contended that he believed his wife was in danger from an unknown protagonist and stated how stupid he felt that he had thought that the neighbour could offer his wife any kind of protection. Jackson remained adamant that he knew nothing of the crime, but that he assumed it was the unknown terror that his wife feared. The jury believed him. After a discussion of some 30 minutes, the jury came back with a verdict of not guilty. Jackson was released and the case was never officially solved. Loose ends. From this convoluted case, several discoveries from Scotland Yard came out. Kate Jackson was indeed Kate Atkinson, daughter of a farm labourer who had made her escape to London in hopes of success on the stage. Instead, she began an affair that changed to blackmail with George Harrison. She had indeed had a relationship with Leopold de Gris, who was a French portrait painter. He had a son from a previous marriage. Whilst in a relationship with him, she called herself Molly Legris. He contended that she was not well educated and did not speak several languages. As for other possible scams being run by Kate, other than Kate being a consummate liar regarding her history, her career and her background, nothing was proven of her scamming anyone else. The case and the intense interest generated by the shadowy Madame X faded, and the crime 
and murderer remain a mystery. That concludes this episode of Frightful Fridays, The Lime Slade Mystery. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.